many newsrooms in Wisconsin and across the country have essentially become hollowed out. They've lost 30 to 40 percent of their reporting workforce. Investigative reporting takes a lot of time and money, a lot of investment. So what we do is we provide these stories for free to all of the editors of the state of Wisconsin and beyond. When I was at the Press Gazette, the center was just starting out and they did some really great work. It was timely, relevant, and um, hit on a lot of issues that were important to our readers. The newspaper had gone through three rounds of layoffs, so it really filled that gap for us. There are very few places today that do the same level of deep uh, investigative journalism on a local and state level as some of the big newspapers like the Washington Post where I work. And the local level is actually as important or more important. So the Center for Investigative Journalism is providing an incredibly important service. So far, uh, about 600 news organizations have used or cited our content. And our goal, of course, is to inform the citizenry and, and strengthen our democracy. We are not an advocacy organization. We're not trying to cater to one political party or the other. And, and that's part of how we keep our legitimacy. We have a marvelous relationship with the School of Journalism and Mass Communication, and the students really drive our projects forward. We also hire paid student interns whose offices are right here in Vilas Hall. They're right there out in the trenches doing the interviewing, analyzing the data, coming up uh, with our findings, accessing public records, holding powerful officials to account. You know, we're doing original reporting. We're not just getting quotes and filing the story. We're really talking to people, getting the data that we need to support whatever we're saying. The most important stories the center has done involve frac sand mining, whistleblowers, and the failure of the state to protect them, water quality issues. These are stories that are critically important to most of us, and they need to be told. And they involve no political bias at all. They're exceptional journalists. The work has won a lot of awards. Results are fantastic. They are leaders uh, that are looked to nationally by other journalism organizations. Dee and Andy are so generous with their time, and they really care about teaching the next generation of investigative reporters, and it's changed my life, and I'm, I'm just really happy to be a part of it. A typical investigation might take us two to three months. Last year, for example, in our failure to, uh, at the Fawcett Project, where we examined threats to Wisconsin's drinking water, we spent more than $60,000. We do not have a subscription. We have some other forms of revenue, but our largest are foundations and individual donations. People who fund our work have no voice in our editorial decisions, and we take great pride in protecting the integrity of the journalism. We are looking for things that other people don't want you to know. We investigate for regular people who don't have any way of figuring these things out on their own. We can't ever rest. We have to remain vigilant always uh, to make sure that the public remains knowledgeable about the actions of the people in power. I'm Nanette Bolabash, and that was a video produced by the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism. I find it very impressing and very inspiring and um, encouraging. Some of you know that I, um, I started out my career as a journalist for radio stations and newspapers. I had three wonderful years working with the Sheboygan Press back at a very exciting time in the early 90s. I worked with local luminaries like Don Jacks Ballou and Bob Bushner and Joe Gulick and John Hill, wonderful people, and the newsroom was just a beehive of activity. And if you follow local journalism, you know the Sheboygan Press and other local newspapers around the country are not what they used to be for a variety of reasons. And it's kind of sad for those of us who were in the business. Um, but fortunately, 
there are organizations like the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism. So I'm thrilled that we actually have two members of their staff here all the way from Madison to join us today in Sheboygan. We've got Dee Hall, who is a managing editor, a long journalism career. Um, she's a managing editor of the Wisconsin Center for, Wisco for Investigative Journalism. We also have acclaimed photographer, photojournalist, digital media editor, Coburn Ducart. So thank you so much, sure. both of you, coming here to join us to talk about your organization, which fills the gap for newspapers that no longer can do what they used to do, whether they want to or not. And they're all changing for a variety of factors. But here you are. So when I see a wonderful story printed on the front page of the Sheboygan Press or, or Journal Sentinel or any other newspaper, it's often done by you. Right. You are providing a free service. Right. And as David Marin has said in the video, over 600 news organizations that you are supplying. So tell us about your um, organization. First, let's start with your background. I want to hear how you got into this field. I got in from Richard Nixon in 1974. Um, Bernstein and Woodward, I mean, they were just like the role models for right. me. Right. That's, so. that's sort of exactly my story, because okay. you and I are almost the same age. Right. So yes, I was inspired back in, when I was in middle school uh, by the Watergate scandal and the role of the press in uncovering that. So I ended up going to journalism school at Indiana University uh, in Bloomington, and I worked at various internships in St. Petersburg, Florida, and Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, Gary, Indiana, and ended up uh, working for uh, eight years at the Arizona Republic in Phoenix. And then, but I, I'm originally from Madison. So when uh, my husband and I, Andy, and he's the co-founder of the center, when we got married and we were expecting our first daughter, we wanted to move closer to family. So we ended up relocating to Madison, working at the Wisconsin State Journal. Still um, a great newspaper. I was there for 24 years. Andy was there for 18 years and then founded the center. So he's, he started working at the center before I did. I joined in 2015. Um, but yes, it's about 10 years old now. Okay. And we've got Coburn Ducart. And as you're listening to us, we're showing some of the wonderful photos that you have taken over the years here. You've got an esteemed background at NPR, National Geographic, several organizations. How did you end up in Wisconsin? Oh, that's a great question. So um, I got into journalism because my father is actually a t was a TV um, photojournalist ah. for his whole career in Washington, D.C., ah. which is where I was born and raised. So as a child, I um, would go to work with him. His car was his office, ah. and he had about four police scanners stacked on the dash oh and about nine antennas all over the car and his trunk was full of photo gear and I just thought that was the coolest so I really looked up to my dad and I enjoyed uh, going on stories uh, with him and then when it came time for me to figure out my career I actually went to UW-Madison majored in journalism went to University of Missouri I have a master's degree mm -hmm. in photojournalism and then um, when I was looking for my first jobs I naturally looked back to Washington DC which is where I was from um, my family was there and so I spent the majority of my career working for media in uh, Washington as you mentioned um, NPR National Geographic I also worked at USA Today and mm -hmm. the Washington Post.com so I really started um, working in digital media and sort of have followed um, that path and then when I had my own family like Dee said similar story had some uh, young kids and decided um, my family had relocated to Wisconsin and I wanted to be closer to them so um, I found the center and the timing um, worked out really well um, I think for all of us so I started with the center almost three years ago and um, yeah. and you work with young interns mm -hmm. And you, but you still go out in the field. Mm -hmm. yep. The photos I'm thinking of are the ones you took um, from the extraordinary session mm -hmm. um, in December, where people were trying to reduce the powers of the new governor. And there were these all night legislative sessions, very heated, very passionate. And you were there mm -hmm. with a young intern taking mm -hmm. photos. Yep. So we're showing some of those today, too. Yeah. So, and so, and we want to make sure people know, and we'll keep showing this link, wisconsinwatch.org is how they can learn yes. about your organization, see some of those photos, mm -hmm. read some of your stories. So describe your organization. You are providing investigative stories 
to local news organizations that don't have those resources. Tell me more. Tell me more. So we, when we started out, we decided very consciously to make sure that the stories would be distributed for free because one of the problems in journalism is a lack of revenue. Yeah. Probably the last thing they're going to do is set aside money to pay somebody else to do stories when they really can't even afford to have their own reporters. And so that was a very conscious decision. Uh, so we have a distribution system where the stories go out to every, we send a story alert out about four or five days before a story uh, goes out under embargo. We let all the editors know it's about to come. You can use it. Here are the photos. Here are the graphics. Um, here's a description of the story or stories if it's multiple stories. Um, and then starting this summer, the Associated Press began distributing our stories, and oh. that's really expanded the so audience. So you're not just Wisconsin. So, so we, our stories, we, we focus on Wisconsin. However, Wisconsin is actually an interesting state to a lot of the nation, as sure it turns it out, because our politics are interesting. There are a lot of interesting trends that start here or get accelerated here. And so we try to put most of our stories, if, if at all possible, in a regional, national, or even global context. Um, and so, but, but at the heart of all of our stories is the state of Wisconsin. That's our key audience. That's our key demographic. And you make a point, and you say this several times on your website, you are nonpartisan, you're not advocating any position, you are being as objective as we possibly can. But as anyone who follows journalism knows, that's hard to find. I mean, people, we're all in our own little bubbles, right? right. My kids uh, are in their early 20s, and they probably get most of their news from Facebook, if at all. Right. And that's not necessarily... Objective. Well, so Facebook has become a platform that we also use because mm -hmm. it's a place where people gather, right? And they right. share stories with each other. We, so now we share our own stories on Facebook, um, and we do it on Twitter. And so, yeah, we, I mean, social media has become a larger piece of our distribution beyond the direct um, tie-ins with, with local editors. We are also putting it out in the social media okay. uh, atmosphere so that people can access our stories from a bunch of different places. Okay, so of all the stories you've been doing all these 10 years, what, what, do you, what has been the biggest, the most impactful? Oh, well, when I uh, started working here, Dee and I started having conversations, and this has been a series they've been working on for a number of years, which is our Failure at the Faucet series. Failure at the Faucet. Failure at the Faucet, which has examined um, the drinking water quality of mm. the state, um, mm. including a large list of um, contaminants that are in drinking water, in, in different contaminants, different parts of the states, including lead, nitrates, bacteria, various pathogens, um, strontium, atrazine, yeah. radium, <laughs> radium. Okay. the right. list goes on. Right. Um, so uh, I think it started as a, a class project yes. for Dee, who is also a teacher. Um, and so uh, it really, it's, it's a great package journalistically, but also um, exemplifies how we work with students and um, really turn them into professional reporters mm. um, and how the impact of student journalism has really had a, a national impact. Um, and in That's terms of that thing. story itself or that series of stories, we won a national um, uh, reporting award for that series of stories. And what, what's most gratifying is we're seeing it now being taken up as an issue by both parties and activists mm -hmm. all over the state saying, okay, we really need to address this problem of drinking water. So that's, that's the idea. We're not telling everyone how it should be addressed or what individuals or uh, officials should do. We're just pointing out the problems. We're showing you know, some potential solutions, but ultimately it's up to the, the people and the, their elected mm -hmm. representatives to come up with a solution that works for everybody. But we're just gratified to see that people are finally recognizing this is an actual issue in Wisconsin, which is a place I think all of us have thought of as having abundant clean water. That's not true everywhere. No, it sure isn't. No, it's, and, and so how wonderful for you to shine a spotlight and so that series is still going on? Mm -hmm. You're still yes, yeah. We are still doing stories. We're not doing as many stories. That was a huge effort that we put in that went on for about a year and a half, two years with these major, looked at major contaminants and tried to drill down very deeply uh, into the impact of each of those uh, contaminants. And now we're more uh, covering uh, one of the biggest issues right now is the bacteria, uh, bacteria nitrate. Uh, so we're doing some follow-up stories on that because that's become a huge issue in a lot of parts of the state. Sure it is. And I think one of your recent ones that you're promoting on your website now is um, this kind of tension between farmers who want to use sustainable energy 
um, and promote that, and yet others saying, mm, no, no, there isn't the resources for that, or you're taking away from yeah, what our solar, tradition used yeah, to be, this, that whole solar thing. Right. It's, it is an interesting tension because I, I think most people support more renewable energy. They understand that's better for the environment, but what's happening is solar has gone from something that you'd stick on the top of your house or hit a building to this 3,500-acre uh, right. um, right. installation. And so the concern there is it's taking over farmland. The, they, they like this particular land food. in Iowa County. Right, food or, or grain, you know, mm -hmm. for animals. And, you know, that's being converted now. Uh, to or probably will be if the project goes forward to um, a massive solar installation, which again would get Wisconsin farther down the road toward renewable energy because we're we're behind most states when it comes to renewables. Uh, but it ha it comes at a cost. It's kind of a local cost for the people who live right there, and especially the farmers who live there. Some of them are benefiting because they're going to lease their land to the project, but some of them fear that this will lock up land that they might need for their own future expansion into, you know, 25 and 50 year leases. Okay. So go to wisconsinwatch.org, make sure you, you look at that, that stories and all your other wonderful stories about state government. But let's talk about journalism in general. Your model, a nonprofit charging no money to newspapers, news organizations to run your stories, you're able to keep doing it. Is that the future of journalism? Are, are newsrooms in, you know, downtown Sheboygan just never gonna come back? I don't know the answer to the, that question. I know that we are a partial answer to the question. We're not the whole answer. Big news organizations like the Washington Post, the New York Times, ProPublica, they're still doing, they're doing well. fabulous work, and they have resources to do that. Um, mm -hmm. So, but that they're not covering your local town council no. meeting or city council. They, you know, they're not going to cover the school board, and so that that's the gap that. And again, we're not filling that gap because we are no. literally a t few people based in Madison working with students. So we, we cannot completely fill that gap. The gap we fill is for more in-depth stories that often get set to the side because of the daily pressure of covering the local mm -hmm. events uh, and the local politicians and what's happening in their communities. And so we're filling the gap in that way. Um, but, you know, in terms of what's going to happen with local newsrooms, it's really difficult for me to say. You know, we've had such consolidation and such, you know, hollowing out of newsrooms. It's, that it's, yeah, strip mining, as you said earlier. Yeah, yeah that in some cases. If, uh, you know, we were, Schweigen Press was a family-owned newspaper. They sold it for a variety of reasons. It's changed hands several times from these national organizations. And um, then investing investment groups come in and just want to reap the profits that they can and shed whatever is not profitable. And... Right. Oh my gosh, you know, 120 years ago, Sheboygan had several daily newspapers, a couple of them in German, um, and then, you know, then we were glad to have one. When I started out in newspapers in Cheyenne, Wyoming, we had a morning and an afternoon daily yep. newspaper. That's, those are just gone. Right, right, they are and pretty it, much gone. It, on the one hand, it, it breaks my heart to see that because it was such an incredible environment to work for, and we were watchdogs. We, we, we covered Sheboygan City Council, Plymouth. I covered Elkhart Lake Village Board, you know, if, if there was some scandal or something, at least somebody was watching that. Or even just the news of the day. I right. mean, you, you know, politicians know when no one's looking. And sometimes they behave and sometimes they don't. And, you know, just being present there physically or at least covering uh, a particular area of the state or a particular board or council, I mean, that puts people on notice that the pu public is watching, that they have somebody in there watching for them. Or so businesses. Does, or businesses or whatever. I mean, I think people are starting to recognize the crucial role that journalism plays in our democracy, and that role is being diminished with these financial troubles. And so one thing that we do focus on is the issue of democracy. We just did a whole mm -hmm. series called Undemocratic where we looked at some, um, some trends that have been happening on the state level that uh, are really uh, whittling away at the power of regular people, individuals, to influence public policy in the state. Like what's an example of that? Well, so redistricting, for example. Oh, right. So yeah, you've got right. somebody who, you know, you, you the, because the lines are drawn a certain way, your vote really doesn't, quote, count because you're either packed into a district that's going to go Democratic or Republican no matter what vote you cast, 
or you're cracked. In other words, whatever influence your party had in that, in that particular area gets diluted to the point where you don't have the influence anymore. So it's led to uncompetitive races, but it's also led to this you know, disparity in the state legislature, for example, where Republicans have two thirds of the assembly seats, and yet they got less than half of the vote. Exactly. Um, so, and, and that's because of the way the uh, that's because of the way the districts have been drawn. Voter ID, for example, right. which okay. you know creates a barrier for certain low-income people, college students, elderly people. That is very difficult to overcome. So it reduces, according to studies, it reduces the voters' turnout, and you know by something like three percent, depending on the study you look at. Well, three percent doesn't sound like a lot until you realize that our state has repeatedly gone to one candidate or the other within that margin, very close, yeah. you know, including the most recent election. Uh, Donald Trump won by one percentage point right. or less than one percentage point. If 3% of people were dissuaded from coming out or blocked in some fashion, well, that could have, you go. That could have made voice. a difference. Who knows? But it's that kind of thing. Um, we also looked at the issue of campaign finance, you know, right. dark money. So people don't really know that there are these sort of hidden influences on their elected officials that come from these groups that give all kinds of money or individuals. And we just don't even know who they are or what their agendas are. But sometimes we find out that it's not our agenda. It's not the public's agenda. It's an agenda set by somebody given secret you know, campaign co uh, contributions. You did mention before we started some positive trends in journalism. I think you mentioned some newsletters here in the state, mm -hmm. some individuals taking on their own, um, by their own in initiative, whether they can make a living at it or not, right. I don't know, but t tell me about it. So are you optimistic that we're, we're gonna be able to keep shining a light on the things that need that light on them? Well, I do feel optimistic. I think one of the things we do is train student journalists, um, and we have a really um, impressive list of alumni who have gone on to um, Smithsonian yeah, national news organizations yeah. and local news organizations across the country. Um, so I do feel very optimistic that those people that we are training are, are spreading out across the country and, and carrying our mission along with them. And many of them um, return. And we just actually celebrated our 10th year um, anniversary. And many of our interns came back. And then also we oh. um, had them send in video testimonials about um, what their time at the center meant to them. And it was really exciting to see um, how far they have gone. Um, but yes, beyond that, there are people in our state who are putting out their own newsletters, covering um, news because it's important to them. And I, I don't know that one newsletter here or there will, will solve the problem, but it is um, something. It does show that people are paying attention and realizing that there's a gap that, that needs to be covered. And if you're just a consumer who just wants objective news that's factual, accurate, and not going to be pushing some bias on, on me, where, where, where do I go? Well, the, the big ones, like the ProPublicas and the Washington Post and the New York Times, um, they're not failing. They're doing fine. Um, we are part of something called the Trust Project. Yeah, tell me about mm -hmm. that. So, um, and I'll, I'll turn this over to Coburn, because she mm -hmm. actually was the one who did all the work for it. But the overall idea there is there is a concern about the quality and the uh, reliability of news that's out there. You know, you've got zillions of websites. This is a little stamp of approval, and I'll mm -hmm. let uh, Coburn talk more yeah. about it because she actually was instrumental in this. Right, so there um, was a movement. Um, it's part of actually a global consortium of newsrooms um, to become uh, an approved member of what's called the Trust Project. And it, we are a member, if you go to any of our stories now, you will see uh, it's a big T logo, Trust Project, and you can click on that for more information. But uh, a requirement to become part of the Trust Project that all these international um, news organizations have agreed to is a set of standards oh, clearly see. identifying okay. that you um, have editorial policies, accuracy policies, fact-checking policies. Oh, um, okay. We have extended bios of all of our reporters on our site saying what their background is, what languages they speak. Um, um, you know, a user agreement policy. We, ha we had to really beef up our own internal policies to comply 
with the trust project. Um, one of the reasons we were invited is because we actually already had um, most of those policies in place. We had been very proactive about making sure that we were very transparent to the public about how we work mm -hmm. um, and you know the steps that we take to ensure our accuracy. But we were able, um, through the process, it took about a year that we went through and I had bi-weekly meetings with a um, whole group of newsrooms from North America. Um, we redid our website, um, but now, you know, we com we comply, and so it also they worked with um, Facebook and other um, digital platforms to surface our stories as trustworthy, with sort of gets a, a stamp of approval to um, sort of identify us as um, real versus not fake um, news. So it, they worked with search engines, Google and Bing, oh, um, to cool. surface our stories as news um, when people start searching. So there was a lot of back end um, coding that went into it. We worked with um, our, our website developers um, so that not only you as the user would see that our site is part of the Trust Project, but on the back end, um, it is being served up um, you know, ahead of other news. So, so there's an incentive to, to be a trustworthy right. news organization. Mm -hmm. Right. I see. Because your stories then will take precedence over the weird website no one's ever heard of exactly. that's got some right. wacky story about a crazy conspiracy theory that is not okay. at all true and somebody so just right. made it up. Mm -hmm. right. So that, that's that's a nice thing. About yeah, and it. the project is expanding, so they're going to keep going and adding more and more news organizations. So it's not just about us. It really is about, and we are one of the, one of the smaller sites that participated, but there were big, I mean, the Washington Post, again, is mm -hmm. part of the trust. Project. So if you see that little T at the bottom of the story, mm -hmm. you know it is following standards mm -hmm. of accuracy and things that you can find. Mm -hmm. and, and I know you have a page on your website about that. Mm -hmm. yep, yep. So we've, we've run out of time already. <laughs> um, but please, I urge people to please go to wisconsinwatch.org to find out more about your organization. Um, you can contact your, your emails are up there. Mm -hmm. We can find you. Um, so it's really pretty, pretty stunning. Yeah. I'm so thrilled that you came here. I'm right. so thrilled you exist <laughs> because this is, this is important work. And thank you for coming to Sheboygan. I, I learned about you from the League of Women Voters. You came as a program. So please come back. And, um, I'll do it. And you now, now you're cleaning up flooding in your basement, but you're oh, in your right. offices. In our offices, yes. Yes. But, but you're overcoming that because journalists can do anything. So um, thank you so much. I so admire your work. Um, thank you. Thanks All right, thank you. Thanks for, Thanks, for Thanks for having us. Thanks for joining us on Legislative Update. This is Nanette Bullabash. Please join us next time. Thank you.